The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. Does anyone in this room know who Dr. Thomas Newberg is? Good, that makes my job easier. <laughs> he works at Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. And for 20 years, he's been conducting a, a, a research project, a study. What do you think he's been studying? Prayer. 60 minutes. You're close. Okay, it's in your bulletin if you look at it. Your prayer, your brain on prayer. He's been studying for over 20 years the effect. That's kind of what my brain looked like. <laughs> Uh, for over 20 years. Now, the way he goes about this, and I just read briefly some of uh, his work, he injects uh, like a radioactive dye or something. I don't know. Does he stick it in your, I don't know, you know, your warm or, But anyhow, and he takes, you know, actual uh, imagery of the brain and gets different colors. And um, the, the effects that the brain changes uh, in different situations. <coughs> But for 20 years, he's been studying the effect of prayer on the human brain. He's made some remarkable discoveries. He's already discovered what many religious people have known for many, many centuries, that prayer can be every bit as important as science, as health care, and helping people, and helping patients to get better. Dr. Newberg was studying a group of Franciscan nuns, and they were in a prayer circle. They were in a prayer time, and they were doing some meditating prayers together. And he discovered that the area of the brain that is associated with the self, myself, me, he discovered that the, the, the part of the brain that was associated with self while these Franciscan nuns were in meditating prayer, that it began to sort of switch off. That it began to sort of go away. Well, not really go away. They didn't lose their self, but... They, he saw that in that particular moment of prayer, in that kind of style of prayer, when that Franciscan, with those Franciscan nuns, that they were becoming less fixated with themselves and more fixated with that which was beyond themselves. They connected more with God. They connected more with the world around them. Their self just sort of went away for a moment. Connection to God. Connection to the world around you. That's a change that takes us toward true healing. James is writing his fellow Christians. He's the leader of the church in first century Jerusalem. And he's this, you've heard me talk about James before. His, his little epistle is like sort of a catechism for early Christians. He's given them some practical instructions. And the instructions here are about some specific things around prayer. And he says the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Will save the sick and raise them up. There's some interesting wording there. Because prayer may not always lead to a cure, but it saves the sick by raising them into the presence of God. I invite you to join me for a moment of prayer. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth this morning, may the meditations of all of our hearts, God, may they be acceptable in your sight. You're our strength. You're our rock. You are our redeemer. And we give thanks for that. Amen and amen. This is for the ladies in the house this morning. What's the best way to get your husband to do sit-ups? Put the remote control of the TV between his toes. You know, he'll start doing, he'll start doing, yeah. He'll, the, one, he'll at least do one. He'll at least do one. And if he's like me, he'll get lightheaded when he does it. Uh, how many of you freak out when you lose the remote control in your house? I go crazy. You know, instead of walking over and working the TV by hand, I spend an hour looking for the remote control. Uh, we love it. I remember my the first I think the first time I saw a remote control. I think I was about 10 years old, and that was a really long time ago. And you go, gosh, Pastor Ron, did they have remote controls back in those days? Yes, they did. You know, we, uh, and I remember going over to some friend's house, I don't know, with my mom and dad, I can't remember, and they had a remote control for their TV. I had never seen such a thing. And what it was, it was, some of you are going to start nodding your heads all of a sudden here. It was a little panel, like a regular remote, but it was attached to it like an extension cord. See, all the heads not. It was a long wire. Some of you are going, they never made stuff like that. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And it had, it was, yeah, it was a long wire. And you could just, you know, you could, as far as, as it was like an extension cord hooked up to the TV. And it would really work it. And so you could get as far away as that extension cord. That had a name. Anybody in here know the name of that device? It was called the Lazy Bones. <laughs> yeah, the Lazy Bones. 
Uh, how many of you can actually remember the last time you got up and walked to the TV? An actual walk where you, okay, some of you are I remember that. Uh, my guess is that probably the last time you did it was when you either lost the remote control or the batteries were dead. And while I'm talking about the batteries, what is it with us? When the batteries get weak, what do we do? Instead of getting fresh batteries, we start doing what? We push the one way out of work. Why do we do that? It doesn't work. Remote, remote controls. We use them for TVs. We use them for DVDs. We use them for CDs. You can get a remote control for just about anything. In fact, is there's one group that's called Remote Control Technology, and they were designed a remote control for you. Amanda, don't get an idea here. They can't control kids in a classroom. <laughs> well, maybe we might experiment with that. But they can make a remote control for just about anything that you want. And I was doing some reading and research. A little girl named Natalie uh, devised a, a, a button that she taped to her remote control for her daddy and it had a button on the TV so that when it, her daddy lost the remote control, she could push the button and it would, a little beep would go off in the remote control. That was sort of a remote control, remote control. Uh, way cool. She ought to patent that thing. I think t uh, telephones are, actually already have that. We live in a remote control society. We really do. We love our remote controls. But here's the question I have for this morning. Does remote control spirituality work? Does a remote control prayer work? Let's think about that. Can we use prayer like a remote control device to get the channels and the programs that we want? Have we become a little too accustomed to being in control? When it comes to prayer, I'm not sure that's how it's supposed to work. Because I think sometimes prayer is not about me being in control. It's about giving that control to someone else. It's about giving that control to someone greater than I am. Someone beyond me. It's about turning that control over to God. There are so many places in our Bibles where we, 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 that we visit, we read, we, we bump into people that pray. They pray for everything. They pray for rain. They pray for the rain to stop. They pray for... We, we have prayers of all kinds. One of the most poignant prayers for me was when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and He said, God, if it's possible, let this cup pass. He, was, he knew what was in front of Him. He knew that He was about to be arrested. And in that prayer, He said, you know, if it's possible. But how did Jesus end that prayer? Say it, Wes. Say it, will be done. Not my will, God. Yours. God, here's the remote control. I'm going to give it up. That's hard to do. But yet Jesus gave us the model. Prayer is so important. So much so that I think it needs to be a constant part of who we are. And one of the things that concerns me sometimes is I think some of us may spend more time each day brushing our teeth than we do praying. Brushing your teeth is important. I don't want you to give that up. But prayer is important too. When I was still teaching, well, I'm still teaching. When I was still a high school band director, uh, I had a student one time that just was really had a tough thing going on at home, a really tough time. And I asked her one day, I said, would you do me a favor? I said, sure. I said, do you have a hairbrush that you use every day? I said, she said, yeah, I do. I said, just put a little piece of tape on the end of that hairbrush. She said, why? I said, because I'm going to put a little piece of tape on the end of my razor that I use every morning. And every morning when I pick up that razor, I'm going to look at that piece of tape, and I'm going to remember that you're going through a tough time. And I'm going to say a quick prayer for you. And every time you brush your hair, when you see that little piece of tape, I want you to remember that I prayed for you that day. I think prayer ought to be constant, and I think it ought to be reflective. Sometimes I don't know what to say when I pray. I go to visit someone in the hospital sometimes, and I don't really have the words that I want. And so sometimes I just stay quiet. I pull a Mother Teresa, <laughs> you know. She was once asked, you know, Mother Teresa, when you pray to God, what do you say? Not much, I just listen. Oh, well, what does God say? Not much, God just listens. <sighs> I love that. Sometimes I just think about Jesus being in the room there with that individual and me keeping my mouth shut. 
When you hit your prayer remote, when you're trying to use your prayer remote control, what prayer channels do you go to the most? Do you pray for healing and wholeness? That's good. Do you pray for happiness and peace? Do you pray for strength, success? The truth is, there's not a thing wrong with praying for any of those things. In fact, is we ought to. But, it's easy to set ourselves up for a big letdown when we expect God to change the world to fall in line with our vision of the way things should be. Pray, absolutely. But let God know, and let God know what is on your heart. But don't forget that sometimes God has a different vision. God's ways are what? Not our ways. And so sometimes we have to give it to God and then let God deal with it. Sometimes God has a different vision of healing, of wholeness, of happiness. You know, Moses had a speech problem. God didn't heal that problem. God used it. And used it through Aaron and others. God uses us the way we are. We wander in the wilderness. We wander around in the wilderness when we expect God to change all of our medical diagnosis, our career path, our teenager's behavior. We wander in the wilderness when we expect God to grow our church or fix all of our problems. And we find our way out of the wilderness when we finally allow God to have the remote control when we drop it and allow God to change us. I got a haircut the day before yesterday. I'm thinking it looks pretty good this morning. Okay, I didn't get much response. You made it different me. <laughs> it's all right. It's my haircut. I like it. But anyway, I go to Sit and Bull over here. Anybody else go to Sit and Bull? I'm like, okay. How do you get there? It's a nightmare nowadays. And say it again. You know, it all depends on the day. It's Sit and Bull is over here on the corner of Ireland and San Marcos. Anybody looked around at the road work going on over there lately? Every day is a new day. You know, I can go down this street today and tomorrow there's a detour sign. You know, and sometimes there's no detour sign. And you just get there and you go, I can't move. And you got to turn. Am I about right here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I went down to, uh, and I went one of the ways I normally go, and it wasn't working. I wound up circling back, and I came down Cresdorn over here, and around, and back up, and went in the, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Somebody told me to tear up King again. I know, it's okay. This is not about streets, this is after the kind of Here's the thing. I wanted a haircut. I needed a haircut. And I wasn't going to let any new teacher or any roadblock get in my way. I was going to find a way to get to where I wanted to be. When it comes to your prayer time, how many teachers and roadblocks do you run into? How many do you create for yourself? I saw a book a couple of years ago. In fact, I think it's still in my library. It's called Too Busy Not to Pray. Sometimes we get to thinking we don't have time to pray. We don't have prayer is important. When it comes to your prayer life, be deliberate. Be intentional. Make time. Anybody in here seen the movie that's just now called War Room? Yes. yes. Darling, yes, Darling and I want to see it. One moment in it, and I hope I, I won't run this for any of you that haven't seen it or planning to see it. There's one room, uh, one moment when the lady is walking, working with her, uh, the prayer warriors working with the, uh, the, the the young woman, and she gets her a cup of coffee. How many of you like a good hot cup of coffee? I do, yeah. And she, she's drinking her cup, cup of coffee, and the, the young lady takes a sip of hers and almost gags. It's room temperature. I mean, there is nothing nastier than room temperature coffee. And she said, I, she gets, she said, this room, coffee's room temperature. She said, you don't like your coffee room temperature? She said, no. And she said, God doesn't like your faith room temperature either. <laughs> Think about that. Wow. Yeah. The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. 
for those of you that haven't noticed, it's actually, where'd those prayer cards go? <laughs> it's on your prayer card. So memorize it and believe it and put it into action. Let's pray. Gracious God, help us to remember daily that prayer is powerful and prayer is effective. God, help us to find a way around the detours and the roadblocks that keep, it, keep us from having a solid prayer relationship with you. In Jesus' name. Good morning, how are you doing? Hi there, young man. Yeah. I went out to the pumpkin patch a while ago and I was looking around. And uh, yeah, and like Grace said, there's, uh, there's a lot of pumpkins there. Uh, I'm not really the mean pumpkin, I'm kind of a nice guy. That's all right, you just want to look at the pumpkins from back. That works too, that works too. I went, you know what I did? I went out there and I looked around, and Grace made a mistake. Uh, there's probably close to 3,000 pumpkins out there. Time you count all the little bitty ones, too, and all, okay? The, yeah, but anyhow, no, there's a lot of pumpkins on that yard. But I was looking around, and you know what I discovered? Believe it or not, I didn't think I could do it. I found two pumpkins that were exactly alike. All the go, wow. I need some help here. <laughs> Everybody go, wow. Wow. <laughs> here they are. <laughs> Two pumpkins exactly alike. What do you think? Wow. <laughs> You're getting ahead of me. That's right. You're right. Yeah. You're going to be... Um, you may be president when you grow up someday. That's awesome. A bishop or something. Who knows? Yeah. Pastor Ron was only kidding you. These two pumpkins are not. I want you to do something for me first, though, okay? Tell me some different ways, some ways in which these two pumpkins are the same. I know. Okay, what's one way? Because that, because that whole thing is bigger than one thing. Okay, that's different. What I'm looking for is something that's the same. Yes. They're both orange. Very good. Yes, sir. They're both kind of the same shape. That's right. Yes. You know what? I like that. He said, this is just a miniature version of this one. I'll give it now. That's awesome. That's awesome. Some other, anybody... Some other way, they both have a stem on the top, don't they? Now, what's different about the stems? Okay, you. Stem is big. What you said? A stem is one stem is big and one stem is little. Yeah, they both have a stem, but this one's kind of tall. This one's kind of sharp. Wow. Yeah. Any other ways in which they're different? No. It looks like. What, what's another way in which they're different? One's kind of small and one's kind of big. Now, here's the important question of the morning. This is the one your moms and dads are going to test you on when you get home after church. No, actually, I want you to test your mom and dad out and see if they did this one. Which one of these pumpkins does God love the most? Both. Both. <laughs> one. This one? No, 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 no. One. One of the things that we remember that makes these pumpkins the same as God created them both. And God loves them both. God loves God's creation. All of creation. I don't think God has a favorite. I think God loves pumpkins so much that God makes big ones and little ones and funny shaped ones and all different kinds. And in the same way, God loves you and God loves everybody. God doesn't have favorites. God loves you because that's the way God is. Isn't that neat to know? Yeah. You're the cutest pumpkin in the world. I am pumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. God, we give you thanks that uh, you love your creation just the way you do. You are so awesome and the variety of life that you give us. And God, we give you thanks.
that you love each and every one of us because you see us as unique and special. Thank you for that. It really helps. Amen. Amen. Okay, guys and gals, y'all can. Yes, good luck, parents. They're all yours. <laughs>